Hi, I'm James Major, the Evening Standards Head of Sport, and I'm pleased to be joined today by Lawrence Delaglio. Born in London, Lawrence is one of Britain's best known rugby stars, a former England captain, winning 85 caps, the World Cup, and literally everything the game has to offer in an England shirt and at domestic and European level with Wasps, and touring three times with the Lions. Since hanging up his boots, Lawrence has been awarded an OBE by the Queen, established a very successful media career, and has raised millions of pounds for charity, including setting up Delalio Rugby Works, an organisation which uses sport to help mentor and support teenagers excluded from mainstream education. Lawrence, thank you so much for joining me today. My great pleasure, James. Good to be, uh, good to be here. Good to be back in London, out in London, should I say. I uh, haven't really gone anywhere, but it's just great to be, uh, you know, to be out and seeing our city, our capital, getting uh, slowly but surely back to its feet. We're here to talk about London's recovery from mm. the pandemic as we come out of lockdown. How have you found lockdown for yourself personally? Well, it's kind of felt um, a long time, but it's happened in a few phases. I think for, for all of us, um, it was a big shock, you know, for, for, for things to go. What was it in March of... Uh, uh, of 2020, you know, straight into in, into lockdown. I think initially, for me personally, I quite enjoyed it um, mm -hmm. because it gave us a chance to spend a bit of time at home. Um, yeah. Living in London, um, like a lot of people, my life is, is fast. It's constantly on the go, uh, always doing things um, and probably don't spend enough time at home. So I think for, for, for many of us, that first period of lockdown where you're suddenly told, sorry, you've got to stay at home um, with your family and friends or with your family at least. And the weather was really nice, wasn't it? I yeah. think so. So first part of lockdown, really good. Um, uh, you know, like everyone else, uh, I did a bit of gardening, uh, did a bit of um, baking, yeah. uh, did all the sort of thing, you know, tidied a lot of things up that, that needed tidying up. And, and generally just dealt with a lot of things that are probably get put on your to-do list that you never actually do. So I enjoyed it. I think the second lockdown, or, or certainly uh, uh, this, we, we came out of it on the other side, then we were told we had to go back into it. I think everyone, including myself, found that quite a challenge. Yeah, and, sure. uh, and that lasted a long, long time as well. So we're, we're only starting now to come out of it at the other end. So, so two parts of it. First bit, really enjoyed. Second bit, um, you know, difficult. And what I have found is since I've re-engaged and started to go out again, there's a lot of people out there. Yeah. You know? First of all, you go out on the streets of London and it was amazing. You know, there'd be no one there. And for people who born and bred like myself in the capital, yeah. that's quite a privilege and a pleasure to go and walk our streets without anyone being on them. Yeah. Suddenly now it feels a little bit daunting. I'm not going to lie, a bit intimidating. But I guess we're going to have to get used to it slowly but surely. You look very well. How have you managed to stay active and motivated and get any exercise that yeah. you would ordinarily get? <sighs> Well, I think there was a number of choices during lockdown, wasn't mm. there? Um, you know, first of all, um, as I said, probably like everyone, just being around your family, um, mm -hmm. looking after each other, kind of coming to terms with, with what we were all going through collectively and not quite sure how long. Um, then, obviously, thankfully, in the UK, um, we were allowed to continue to exercise, so I did a fair bit of that. I mean, I was always a, a good exerciser anyway um, mm -hmm. from, my, from my rugby career. So I, so I exercised pretty much every other day or every day. Um, but e equally, I was eating quite a lot of food as well. So yeah. I think I split my time between exercising. I actually became very productive during okay. lockdown, I, I feel, because uh, in London, as you know, a lot of time can be spent getting around. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't call it dead time, but it's certainly time where you're either travelling to a meeting or coming back from a meeting. And of course, when all those meetings suddenly were, were on your desk in front of you, yeah. um, I became a lot more productive. Okay. Uh, I think the, the big problem, and I'm sure all, all Londoners would agree, or, or hopefully a lot of other people would agree, you know, are you working from home or were you sleeping in the office? Yeah. You know? and, and I think initially, probably a bit of both, you know, back to back calls all day, every yeah. day. I think the balance for all of us is, is actually I am at home and I am working from home as well and I've got to get that balance right. Do you find that that exercise has been helping with your mental health as much as with your physical health? Yeah, I mean, I've always felt that finding moments in the day to do some sort of physical mm. uh, or, or, or mental exercise is really important, mm. you know, just finding time to be in the present, in the moment. Um, yeah. Everyone thinks that exercise has got to be going to the gym, it's got mm -hmm. to be 
running at 100 miles an hour or cycling at 100 miles an hour that that is effectively mm -hmm. you know you can do it that way but just going for a walk or or or, or just taking a little bit of exercise so yeah I, I always try and find moments in the day whether it's physical exercise or whether it's just sitting there you know in 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 mindfulness stillness okay. meditation whatever yeah. it might be and yes you know it generally has a, a positive effect i can maybe think about things differently and approach things in in a slightly different way but here to talk about london's recovery from the pandemic yeah. what role do you think outdoor sport has to play in that i think um i think sports uh, both your own participation but equally, you know, outdoor sport and entertainment has a huge role to play mm -hmm. um, in in reigniting um, our society, uh, our culture, our, our, our way of being. Uh, and obviously, not just nationwide, but in London as well. So, um, you know, sport has been going on, but it's been going on behind closed doors. Fortunately, we've been... Uh, been able to exercise and, and and now things are slowly starting to open up i was in the gym this morning mm -hmm. um which felt unusual thing to say because i haven't been able to say it for a long long time but yeah. um you know i think there's a there's a confidence out there people are slowly getting starting to feel like they can they can take small steps the gym wasn't packed but then again on a wednesday morning i'm not sure the gym is ever packed actually yeah. uh, <laughs> so uh, yeah look it, i think sport and entertainment in particular and I, and I wouldn't exclude entertainment has got a huge part to play in 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 rebooting london london culture and london society are, are you happy with the pace of the return to sport or do you think the government could be doing more to accelerate it i think the important thing is i mean going back to what i said just now it, it's a really big area that the government, I know, are working incredibly hard mm -hmm. to uh, to bring back. Um, I think the important thing is it's got to be done safely and it's got to be done securely. And I don't think myself or anyone else can emphasise that enough. Yeah. Um, I think it's a big few weeks for, for London and for the government. We've got the Carabao Cup this weekend, uh, Manchester City against Tottenham. And I know that the government have been piloting and this is probably their biggest pilot yet to date so mm -hmm. i think we'll find out a lot more mm -hmm. about where the government are with regard to returning to sport um, my personal belief is that we need to test people safely at home yeah uh, i think there's techniques and technologies that exist so that when people are leaving their front door to go into a sporting environment that they can report a negative covid test sure. and they can uh, even though they may be asymptomatic, they're not mingling them with healthy people. So yeah. I think there's a way to go yet, um, but I know that the government are working hard to come up with the right, the right uh, techniques, the right technology to make sure that we can do it safely and securely. And the sooner that happens, not just for sport, but for things like theatre and entertainment, sure. then it's huge because yeah. it's the heartbeat of London, really. Yeah. Just looking more at the grassroots side of things, a worry for me is the inequality in access to sport and to exercise mm. um, across different sectors of society. Is that a worry that you share? Yes, it is. Um, it's, this isn't just a London issue either. It's, yeah. it's far greater than that. But if we focus on London, I think the inequality that exists in, in this country is, is pretty significant. Mm -hmm. I think COVID has exacerbated that inequality. I think the social gap has got bigger. Yeah. Um, between those who have and those who don't have. And I think the government um, are acutely aware of that. Um, yeah. And they need to do things to, to, to close and bridge that gap. We all need to do things to close and bridge that gap. Um, if you're a young person growing up in London right now, you know, do you have the access? Do you have the uh, opportunities available? Um, you know, is it down to background? Is it down to circumstance? Is it down to, to how much money you have in your pocket? And, and I would argue that we need to do more to help those um, from disadvantaged backgrounds particularly. I think this is a good moment to talk a bit more about your charity, yep. Delalio Rugby Works, and how you help disadvantaged kids through rugby. Can you tell us a bit more about the charity, how it works, and the impact that it has? Yeah, we, we work with, uh, with young boys and girls, um, you know, aged from, from 14 to 17, although we work probably a little bit either side of that as well. Um, and predominantly we work from with disadvantaged kids who are becoming disengaged in their education. Okay. They haven't completely fallen out of education, although for a lot of them, we tend to work in 
alternative provision schools, pupil referral units, although some mainstream as well. And we work with a demographic of young people who are disengaged. And what we use is my sport, rugby, mm -hmm. but that's really the hook to get these young people thinking very differently about themselves, about their futures. And ultimately, we're trying to drive a set of behaviours that, that give these young people positive and productive outcomes. Now, that might be continuing their education. It might be looking into some sort of career path. You know, it's... It's very hard being a young person in, 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 in London today uh, and in society. It's even harder if you haven't had the opportunities available to you. A lot of the young kids we work with come from fairly chaotic backgrounds. Um, you know, they, they don't necessarily have the support systems available. So our coaches mentor these young people. Uh, we work both inside the classroom uh, and outside the classroom uh, with, with, uh, with the rugby. And, uh, and it's working really, really well. You know, we're having an incredible success rate. We work in over 17 schools in London alone, uh, around about 35 schools across the country. Um, and, uh, you know, it's doing some great work. And I, I think the government have got to recognise that there's a gap that, is, that has grown over this last 12 months. And sports, physical health and well-being is an opportunity for the government and for everyone to bridge that gap. Um, you know, why should you be um, given three times as much exercise if you go to a fee-paying school as if you go to a state school? You know, the, the number of hours in a day don't change, so why should the opportunity to exercise change? Um, so, yeah, I think there is opportunities. I would urge the government, and I have been working with the government, to try and think about maybe extending the school day by a couple of hours. Okay. You know, we need to do something quite dramatic, I believe, to... Um, um, to reinvigorate, to reboot the, the, the young people in society, to give them hope, to give them the same kind of opportunities that we had growing up. So, uh, yeah, there, there's a number of ideas, but I think extending the school day by a couple of hours, and what I'm asking for there is not getting teachers that are currently working their fingers to the bone to do more. It's about bringing in third-party organisations like Rugby Works, like the Rio Ferdinand Foundation, like, you know, um, Kelly Holmes Trust to deliver sport and exercise because I genuinely believe that sport, well-being and exercise is such a crucial part of us coming out of this pandemic. So it sounds to me it's about levelling the playing field and yeah. delivering opportunities for kids. Is that the crux of the, the organisation? Yeah, well, absolutely. We're, we're about um, working with those with a part of society that I think society tends to forget very quickly. Yeah. You know, um, I think if you go, you know, if you if you're in secondary school, um, you know, sport is you, one. You should have access to sport at yeah. all levels. Uh, I think we should be passionate about it. Um, you know, we currently, in terms of our health and well-being, we're not in we're not in great shape as a country. We might think we are, but we're not. Yeah. And I think, you know, sport, physical well-being, and and, and, and health is uh, such an important way of. Of, of making sure that our young kids grow up with a healthy and prosperous future. So it is about levelling the playing field and making sure that no matter what background you're from, no matter what situation you're born into, that everyone is given equal opportunities. Do you recognise something of yourself in these kids that you're helping? Um, I know you suffered a, a horrific tragedy when you were younger and you lost your uh, sister on the Marchioness yeah. um, boat disaster. Yeah. Is that part of the motivation for setting up this charity yeah i mean I, well two things on that james well, firstly um you know i didn't come from a chaotic background yeah. i was lucky enough so i had you know you know i was given a, a unprecedented amount of of love and care when i was growing up yeah. and, and, I, and i was given a belief system to go out there and really conquer but but i did i lost my sister in in london uh, tragically one night in august in 1989 and i think what that you know momentous moment in my life uh, you know, came at the age of 17 and, and it kind of sent me, as you would understand, into a fairly difficult few years. I was in a bit of a downward spiral. I was making poor decisions. Um, I was getting myself in and out of trouble uh, and things were looking pretty bad. And I think rugby was a, uh, was a hook for me. I, I, I used rugby as a way of, of, of turning my life around, giving me the opportunity to move things forward. It helped me personally and it helped my parents. So I think as I then moved throughout my rugby career, when I finished uh, in 2008, what I wanted to do was, was set something up to give back because I believe with success comes a certain degree of responsibility uh, and an opportunity to help other young people. Um, you know, I asked myself the question, if I was 14 again, 
and I found myself in a really difficult situation or I came from a chaotic background or I was, you know, uh, one of these young people suffering in that inequality gap that we discussed, mm. would I want someone to come in and help me? And the answer is, yeah, of course I would. So, um, you know, I, I think we need to be able to offer that support system to young people. And what we have to understand is that GCSEs and A-levels are not for every young person. You know, some people are really good at them. Uh, we all obviously have to, to a certain degree, um, you know, educate ourselves. And, and, but there are other ways of, of engaging young people. And we've become obsessed with education in this country and the metrics around education. Of course, they're important. But actually, why don't you measure sport as well? Why don't you measure physical well-being? Why don't you measure health? Because they can be uh, equally as important as, uh, as, as GCSEs and A-levels. And I think what COVID has shown, where we haven't actually got young people taking their exams, is that they don't need to take their exams to be told that they're good at, uh, at maths and English. How have you met the challenge of delivering this good work through the pandemic? Have you found it more difficult to reach young people? Yeah. Have you felt the frustration of not being able to have this kind of impact that you normally would? Um, yes, in, in, a, in, a, in a matter of speaking. I mean, uh, I think we've experienced what a number of other charities will have experienced. Um, you know, your fundraising immediately is cut off overnight. You know, no events, no ability to raise money. Uh, therefore, that is a, a, a big risk for, for a charity like Rugby Works. Uh, but more importantly, our ability to deliver the programme was also you know, limited. Schools were shut, no events, so no money coming in, and your ability to deliver the programme immediately turned off overnight. And I think, more importantly, the young people that we work with, boys and girls, are extremely vulnerable. As I said, they're probably safer at school sometimes than they are in their home environment. So for our mentors, our coaches, not to be able to communicate with our young people because schools are shut yeah. suddenly becomes very difficult. So, uh, you know, it was a, a challenge for us, but out of all challenges comes opportunity. And what we've now been doing as a, as a charity is creating a digital platform. And we've, we've got some investment and, we, you know, we're, we're looking for some more to create a digital platform in the future so that if, this, if something like this ever happens again, our young people have got the ability to talk to each other and to talk to their mentors and coaches. Um, so, you know, that's something very positive. And as I said, slowly but surely, we were able to get back into schools. And I think what we found is that the young people are desperate to, to receive services like ours. They're desperate for us to be back up and running again. Yeah. Uh, and they said that they've missed us, which is a great thing to have. Um, as we emerge from the pandemic, just changing tack slightly, um, there's a lot of sport to get excited about this summer, isn't there? There's the Olympics, the Euros, the Lions Tour. The Euros could feel like a home tournament. How excited are you about what we have to come in the, in the coming months? I'm very excited um, because I'm a massive sports fan and I know what the power of sport can do for all of us. Um, and as you say, the, the, you know, the big events, the, the Euros, the Lions, I mean, they're, they're moments that we look forward to. They're moments that we, that, that we can't wait to, to, to be part of. Um, there is a part of me that has a, a slight reservation around whether, you know, sport has done a wonderful job in, in filling some of the blanks in people's lives, particularly through this pandemic. You know, I've been lucky enough to be able to go to these stadiums and, um, and be part of, present, commentate live sports uh, throughout the pandemic. And, uh, you know, it, it's a privilege to be there. Yeah. And, and, and credit to the players and, and participants of all sports that they've been able to just carry on doing what they're doing. I have to say, though, it's very difficult to do it without fans. Fans yeah. are an integral part of sport. Sport is about emotion. It's about love. It's about hate. It's about every single emotion in between. And, and I think the connection between fans and sport is so, so important. So, you know, yes, I'm excited to answer your question. Yeah. Um, you know, the Euros could be here. We could have, we were supposed to have the semi-finals and finals at Wembley. Yeah. You know, there could be so much more going on. Yeah. We've got the Lions Tour going ahead in South Africa. But I guess the big if is will there, will there be fans there, yeah. you know, or the big but. Do you think we can pull it off? Do you think the government can host it safely here, given what, what well, we know now? They're doing, what they're, they're, they're doing their very best, I yeah. think. Um, I think the next couple of weeks are going to be quite fundamental yeah. to that question. I can't answer it straight away. Sure. I think we'll know a little bit more. There will be some fans there. Yeah. It's just how many, uh, because everyone wants to go. Everyone wants to be part of it. Yeah. But we want to do it in a safe and secure way. So my answer is yes, I'm excited. Yeah. Um, you know, even as a Chelsea fan, even I'm looking at Harry Kane's ankle saying, you know, <laughs> please, please, can we get better? Yeah. Um, so, you know, fingers crossed, 
you know, things are moving in the right direction and the government has some good news to announce in the, in yeah. the next few weeks. What about the Lions Tour? What are our chances of returning from South Africa, one of the toughest places that you ever toured with a series yeah. victory behind us? Yeah, I mean, again, it's very tough. Um, Warren Gatland is, is, is assembling a squad. That squad is announced on the 6th of May, so yeah. I'm sure we'll, uh, we'll have much, much comment and debate in the, uh, in the evening standard about that. Really excited to look at that squad. Uh, playing against the world champion South Africa, so uh, yeah, it's a it's a big uh, it's a big task ahead. Uh, South Africa themselves have not played very much rugby uh, yeah. as a team, so I think the same challenges that the Lions have are represented by South Africa. So uh, ordinarily, I'd say it's a, it's a very tough um, challenge, but I think without crowds or without the you know the, the huge volumes of crowds, I mean, it makes it more of a 50-50. So yeah, Warren, Warren and the squad have got a great opportunity there. What about the England team? I mean, it was a Six Nations Championship that um, yeah, England will want to forget. There's mm. been a review into it, hearing that the RFU want to stick with Eddie Jones. They think he's the right man to, to guide us out of this. One, do you agree with that conclusion? And two, what, what do you need to put in place to make things <sighs> better from here? Well, I think there's, uh, there's, there's been a full review. I think people have to kind of understand that, you know, with England, it, it, you know, he's the, he, Eddie Jones has delivered results for England. Um, mm -hmm. You know, these, they've won three of the last six, um, six Nations titles and they got to a World Cup final. Um, I think, unfortunately, there's, this last season has been pretty disappointing. But I guess the review kind of came to the conclusion that um, whilst Eddie Jones needs... To, needs to maybe make some changes to his support staff and bring in some fresh faces on the uh, on the playing and the coaching side. There has been mitigating factors. Um, they created a COVID restrictive bubble, which was probably over restrictive. Didn't need to be quite as difficult as uh, as it was, and I think that put a lot of pressure on the players. You know, being away for eight weeks in a hotel and not being able to move out your room other than to train um, doesn't really prepare you to go out on the field and play yeah. with a smile on your face. So. Um, I think Eddie Jones, you know, had to self-isolate himself for a number of weeks, as did quite a few of his coaches. You know, these are the, the preparations were, were 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 strained, but I think there's um, everyone has learnt the lessons from the review. Hopefully, um, and look, England should never finish fifth in the Six Nations, really. So uh, I think they all know that, as they say, they're on a last warning. Does he have the leaders in the playing squad to be able <coughs> to recover from this? You're a former England captain. If you were in his dressing room, what would you be saying to the players? You know, it's not all about Eddie, is it? It's about the players doing this for themselves as well. No, so I think I think they have they have a group there that is you know is a pretty special group. Um, but equally, between Eddie and and the players, they need to continue to improve. So if you need to bring new players in from outside to uh, to freshen up that group, yeah. then uh, then then that's what needs to happen. And I think certainly the players will take a look at themselves. You know the leadership of England in a rugby can always can always improve. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I would I would I would challenge maybe one or two of them to go away and and lead their clubs on a regular basis. If you can have as yeah. many cap guys captaining your club week in week out, then I think it adds to that leadership group. So, yeah, look, you know, lots to be optimistic about moving forward. Um, you know, England have got a relatively um, uh, stress-free tour of, of, of America uh, yeah. where they're playing the USA and then they can build again for next season. Would many of the England players get into your Lions team right now? Who would you pick that deserves a place in that 15? Um, it's difficult to say really. I mean, I think when you finish fifth, you don't, you don't give yourself much opportunity to be picked. Mm. And, and look, there will be some big name players that miss out um, uh, on selection because Scotland have had a good championship. Wales will finish top. And Ireland produced uh, the goods, particularly against England. So, um, I think the coaches have got to weigh up some players who remain in credit from the last tour. Warren Gatland would have, you know, would, would have had good relationships with the likes of Jamie George, Owen Farrell, Mara Lato Mara Atoji, for mm -hmm. instance. Uh, but equally, guys like Elliot Daly, Billy Vanapola, you know, there's a lot of England players that will be wondering whether they've done enough to get picked. Um, and. You know, who knows? We'll find out on, on May the 6th. But you can't pick everyone. Warren and Gatlin can only pick 36 players. And, uh, you know, it, it becomes very, very difficult. And the other thing that to, to, to bear in mind is 
Warren Gatlin's got to pick people that are not just playing well, but equally he's got to pick people that he know he can take away for nine weeks and they're going to be able to survive in a hotel environment. You know, mm -hmm. you are going to South Africa on tour, but you may not actually be able to see any of South Africa. So other than your hotel room, training, the bus to training and the stadiums, you may not see a, a whole lot more. So um, that in itself presents quite a unique challenge for anyone going on a, on a tour. So you've got to pick good characters as well, people that can, can keep the personalities going, can keep the energy going in the, uh, in the build-up to big games. Um, so, yeah, it's going to be a tough job picking that squad for sure. Lawrence, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Thank you very much for your time today and yeah, I look forward to seeing you again very soon. Thank you.